Welcome to the Unitarian Universalist Congregation at Montclair. My name is Marcus Cray Hauk. I'm the Director of Music Ministries and my pronouns are he, him and his. We're going to start with our gathering hymns in a moment and after that we'll light our chalice. And you are going to be invited to light something in your home as well and this might be a good time for you to find a chalice, a candle or something else you can illumine. Our first hymn is the African-American spiritual, There is More Love Somewhere. Our hymn leader is Will Hill. There is more love somewhere there is more love somewhere and I'm gonna keep on to love find it there is more love somewhere there is more hope There is more hope somewhere And I'm gonna keep on Till I find it There is more hope somewhere There is more peace somewhere there is more peace somewhere. 
away I'm gonna keep on Till I find it There is more peace Somewhere There is more joy Somewhere There is more joy Somewhere I'm gonna keep on till I find it. There is more joy somewhere. There is more joy somewhere. There is more joy somewhere. The text for the next hymn is brand new. It was written by Amanda Udis Kessler, who is a Unitarian Universalist musician in Colorado Springs. The melody is not new. It comes from the song, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing, which is in our hymnal. We are gathered in the Spirit, though our bodies are apart. Filled with joy and touched with wonder, separate hands but mingled hearts, giving thanks and singing praises for the love that calls us home. From our many different places, we are gathered into one. We are gathered in our sorrow, we are gathered in our fear, in our pain and in our worry, in our anger, in our tears. As we tend to one another with our gifts and with our care, our community is strengthened through the hope and faith we share. We are gathered in commitment to a planet that is whole. Works of justice, acts of kindness, bless the world and heal our souls. As our voices join together, may a song of peace resound. May we offer in abundance all the grace that we have found. Yes, there is more love somewhere, and here we have gathered. On this Easter Sunday, in the midst of the Passover season, in this time of spring and the pagan celebration of Ostara, whoever you are, Wherever you come from, whatever age, identity, history, ability, gender, sexual orientation, or political affiliation, know you are welcome to bring your full self here. Grounded in faith, we come together to nurture the soul, inspire hope, and bring into being a more just and loving world. If you're joining us at 9.30, please continue with us with Connection Cafe, a Zoom link has been sent over announcements and it's available in your Realm events as well. If you are at all like me, you are experiencing in this time of challenge, deep wells of sadness and moments of utter confusion. This is not easy. And know everything that you are feeling is normal and natural. Be gentle with yourself. We will get through this together. And together we will light the beacon of our faith, our chalice. If you have a chalice at home, please find something to illumine and join us in this chalice lighting ritual as we share our affirmation words. 
Let us open our eyes to see what is beautiful. Let us open our minds to learn what is true. And let us open our hearts to love one another. Now with our chalices lit, let's turn to our time for all ages. There's a story I know that speaks about birds, but not only birds, it also speaks to us even now in this time that we are living in, it speaks to us. And it's a story that I know to be true, even if it never happened. This is a story about birds in a forest and the hunters that would have them trapped and sold for their feathers. At first, the hunters caught the birds one by one, but they quickly tired of this tedious method and developed wide snares to net the birds all together. The strong birds, the young birds, and the large birds could escape the nets, but the weaker, the smaller, the older birds would be trapped. At first, the stronger birds were brazen and boastful, cooing about their ability, but soon even these stronger birds couldn't ignore the plight of their neighbors, especially the fear of their elders. So soon they, the stronger birds, felt themselves caught between the freedom of the sky and the grief of losing their dear ones. So a meeting was called, calling together the many birds of the forest, and each bird offered their fear into the circle. The young and the old, the weak and the strong, the anxious and the calm, all different songs. And when one bird sang, the whole world seemed to quiet. For underneath the repeated mourning, the repeated call of lament and sadness, there was a deeper song about freedom and looking forward to a brighter future together. The young bird said, we are not alone. We are in this together. And together we are strong. Together we can do it. Hearing this, the bird family couldn't ignore their shared struggle, so they drafted a plan, a way for them to escape the nets together. And soon, very soon, they had to test their plan as the hunters had witnessed their gathering. A net suddenly entwined them and trapped them in a great startled huddle. Fear came first and then panic. But the birds that could reminded them to breathe and remember their plan. Then all together, together, they began to flap their wings and all together, together, slowly, very slowly, they rose higher and higher and higher, all together under the net so high and unhindered by the trees of the forest that they could begin to lean each in the same direction. Tilting farther and farther, their small bodies in unison, as though they were one, and the net, the net so solid once, slid off their backs and dropped to the ground, landing far, far below them. Let me pause here. This is a real photograph, a sparrow murmuration. The sparrows here are fleeing prey together. They're collecting and flying in a symphony of movement to save not one of themselves, not two, but hopefully to save them all. And you'll see that in their collective work, they resemble one giant, powerful sparrow. The birds, the birds from our story, they flew up just like this and out into the open sky and they sang, we did it. Together, oh, freedom. After that, a new melody could be heard in the forest. A melody of unity and shared freedom and how together, only together, we can rise.
up in a twisted lies. You may try me down in the very dirt, and still like the dust I'll rise. Does my happiness upset you? Why are you best with the glue? Cause I laugh like I've got an oil well pumping in my living room. So you may shoot me with your words. You may cut me with your eyes. Our eyes, our eyes, our eyes, rise, rise. Out of the shacks of a history shame, up from a past rooted in pain. Now did you want to see me broken, bowed head and lowered eyes, shoulders falling down like teardrops, weakened by my soulful cries, well does my confidence upset you, don't you take it all for hard, cause I walk like I got a diamond mine breaking up in my front yard, so you may shoot me with your words, you may cut me with your eyes, and I'll rise, I'll rise, I will rise, I'll rise, out of the shacks of a history shame, up from a past rooted in pain, and I'll rise, I'll rise, I'll rise, 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 so you may write me down in history with your bitter twisted lies you may trod me down in the very dirt and still like the dust i'll rise does my happiness upset you why are you best with the glue cause i laugh like i got a gold mine digging up in my living room now you may shoot me with your words you may cut me with your eyes our eyes our eyes our eyes rise rise out of the shacks of a history shame up from a past rooted in pain our eyes our eyes our eyes rise rise our eyes our eyes our eyes rise rise our eyes our eyes our eyes rise rise thank you marcus and special guest will hilton for that powerful anthem and now join me as we enter in this space of depth each as we are called finding a soft meditation a deep reflection or perhaps an ardent prayer each as we're called yet mystically all together we enter into this space by hearing the lamentations, the requests, and the remembrances of our community. Let us hear one another to heal one another. Peg Sipe lights a candle for Kitty Kalina Bessie and the heroic shopping runs she and others have done for our community. Mary Jones lights a candle for her next door neighbor, Maria Lopez, a nurse who died of COVID-19, and for Maria's surviving children, Anthony and Justine. Dion Ford lights a candle of sorrow for her friend Kevin Thomas, who died in April from COVID-19. Mary Moriarty lights a candle of remembrance for her beloved brother, Stephen, who died on Monday, March 30th. May his tender and generous soul be at peace. Claudia Sanders lights a candle in memory of Pat, a fellow hospice volunteer. A bright light has left this world. Peter Arian lights a candle for Andy Cohen, a very good friend and old neighbor who passed from COVID-19 on April 5th. O'Neill Nato lights a candle for Ms. Lou, otherwise known as Maybelline Louise Redden, O'Neill's grandmother, who has died. A candle of remembrance for Ryan Kalenovich, a 2019 graduate of Montclair High School who died Thursday night. 
Laura Thomas lights a candle for her student, Zhuidi, who left New York City for China and is now hospitalized in quarantine with COVID-19. Laura also lights a candle for her friend Larry, a fellow actor who's been on a ventilator in New York City for three weeks. Prayers and blessings for Wayne Foti, who tested positive this week for COVID-19. He says he is feeling better, but he asks for your healing prayers. So much pain and sorrow. May our listening bring forth acts of love. Please join me in the spirit of prayer. Spirit of life known in so many ways by so many names. Gracious power of unfolding love known by no single name completely. We gather this morning in virtual yet very real ways to be present to one another, to seek community, to hold one another in a time of trial. We are gathered to comfort one another in the common struggle through which we now live. We are gathered to hear one another's dreams and fears and to bring hope and perspective to this trying time. We have learned that no matter what our theology, we search for that which saves us and the ways of life that we love. We have learned that salvation is a team sport. It is what people do together to save one another as they rise to the challenges of the age in the face of whatever dangers are out there. Today we live with the very real presence of fear and death all around us. But we are a resilient people, bolstered by faith, our love for one another, and a common mission, striving to serve the greater good. And one thing that I know in my heart is I know that fear will never silence us. My colleague, the Reverend Aldette Fulbright Fulsom, composed these words that might help us in this time. Do not think we are finished, oh no. Do not think we will be silent. No, there will not be silent until the world has sung the names of the dead with full throats. Do not think fear is the end of us. No, fear for our lives is not the end of our story. Let us not be silent about our own fears. Let us not be silent about the plight of those suffering disproportionately during this crisis, black and brown folks, healthcare workers, the sick, the elderly, the poor. Let us instead go through our days knowing that there is more love, more hope, more joy somewhere. And we pray that it come to us, to our hearts. I invite you with that in mind, with that in heart, to deepen your prayers into this silence. In the name of all that each of us deems holy within our own hearts, we pray. Amen. And now I invite you to join us in singing. There is a love. There is a love.
scriptures, John chapter 20, verses 1 through 8. This gospel reading arrives for our attention three days after what is recorded as the Last Supper. When Jesus spoke to his disciples over the Passover table, exhorting them to love one another as I have loved you. And this reading follows two days after the crucifixion, the death of the one that his followers had come to know as the Messiah, the one that would save them. Here is the reading. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the ent entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, and said, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have put him. So Peter and the other disciple started for the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent over and looked in at the strips of linen lying there, but did not go in. Then Simon Peter came along behind him and went straight into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the cloth that had been wrapped around Jesus' head. The cloth was still lying in its place, separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple, who had reached the tomb first, also went inside. He saw and believed. And so ends the reading. I like to imagine myself there, at the entrance of the empty tomb, the stone rolled away. The body missing, the body of the prophet called Jesus, the one who was killed for being a rabble rouser, a political threat to empire. The body was gone. This is the Easter story, missing. The nothing, where there once was something. This is the Easter story. And then, and then I realize that I am already there, that I am living this story in a new age and a new way. I am there at the threshold of the empty space, just like the followers of the Messiah were, and I am finding an absence where there had been a presence. I know there had. Before this, there was something there, right? I had held it in my hands. I had felt its tender comforts. There had been a schedule with connections, there had been commerce and interactions, the regularity of my day and my week, a spaciousness with which to move, rooms, hallways, a sanctuary. There had been Sunday mornings, blessed with hugs and handshakes, and the vague assurance of my general safety, no matter how naive and privileged this assurance was. And there had been the rash presumption of my independence, my capacity to move in this world as I wanted to move, when I wanted to move, how I wanted to move, no matter how dangerous this presumption was. But now the stone has rolled away, rolled away and left us aghast. And we, if I can speak for us, we are staring at the absence, at the threads of a life that we had been living, at the great chasm to fill, to fill, to fill with our faith, 
in the face of this incredible challenge, to fill with our faith, not with stuff, not even with toilet paper, to fill with faith, faith to grieve openly, to trust lovingly, to know honestly that even as this breaks, burdens, and changes us, even as we suffer incredible loss, something has never left us and something will be reborn. To the followers of Jesus, the absence, the empty tomb meant something. More than something, it meant everything. They came to call the mystery resurrection. I'm not interested in the supernatural explanation, especially on a day like today when the natural one feels so much more necessary. I want to know what they, what the followers standing there and staring at that emptiness, I want to know what they created, what they filled the space with. I want to know what they created staring at the empty tomb. At the Passover Seder, yes, Jesus celebrated Passover. Jesus was Jewish. And Passover is the Jewish celebration of freedom, the remembrance of the Israelites' collective escape from Pharaoh. So at the Passover Seder, the last that he would celebrate. Jesus raised a glass of wine and said, Love one another as I have loved you. Over the haroset and the matzah, the lamb shank and the wine, love one another as I have loved you. This was his lasting wish for their, for his friends and loved ones, for their freedom love one another. These are the words of one who knows that his time is limited, that realizes human vulnerability, that wants to pass a ministry from two hands to twenty. And these are the words today, alive in the acts of healthcare workers, dying to preserve life for others, and these are the words alive in the acts of grocery store clerks and delivery drivers and trash collectors in the acts of first responders who are putting themselves in harm's way to salvage life for others. And these are the words that live in your acts of persistence and kindness getting groceries for friends, dropping off flowers, calling neighbors, serving our homeless, supporting one another, and just getting up every morning and breathing. Do not hear me wrong. The virus has already taken so very much from us. Love doesn't save everyone. But faith manifest in our love is the only faith that will fill, really fill, the emptiness of this time. So I ask, as the storm passes over, what will be salvaged and what will be reborn? I've been reflecting on this and hoping that it might come to pass that the coronavirus will mark the end of our romance with hyper-individualism, that we will turn instead to know the blessing of interdependence and our Unitarian Universalist faith compels this interdependent blessing, and that the notion that freedom is the freedom to act as one wants in self-serving ways will finally and fatally dissolve in this, our collective struggle. We have seen clearly, so very clearly, that self-seeking behavior from Trump on down made this crisis much more dangerous than it needed to be. And here is my prayer, that when this ends, we will reorient our politics and invest in social goods for health, especially. 
and that when this ends, interdependence will supersede independence, linking us in a social contract with a moral code. And that when this ends, I will remember how the cheap shirt I wear from the sweatshop that denies sick leave to its workers makes me, makes all of us more vulnerable to illness, and that when this ends, I will remember how it was the earth in its green brilliance that tended me, that nurtured me, that made me whole, an earth that I cannot bear to sacrifice or plunder because its survival is knit to my soul. This is my prayer, and this is my faith, when I see the emptiness, this is my faith. If I can speak for the prophet, for Jesus, from the scriptures, as I have read them, Jesus didn't get stuck on the notion of the individual any more than starlings do. Jesus wasn't in the business of what evangelicals often misquote him as doing, saving individual souls. Jesus was ensnared by that all-too-American worship of the one, that rampant individualism. Jesus was all about the collective, the kin, and what we might do with the miracle of being together. What we might do with the miracle of being together and acting as one. A few years ago, George F. Young and his colleagues investigated starlings and their remarkable ability to maintain cohesion as a group in a highly uncertain environment. They used a highly mathematical approach and discovered that the birds accomplish this when each bird attends to seven neighbors, watches, mirrors, and attends to seven neighbors. The birds are a part of a dynamic system, and this, this murmuration, results. The Gospel story, it doesn't quite talk about a murmuration, but it's the way I understand it. When Jesus died and the followers were left with emptiness, they turned to one another. The empty tomb was their desperation, but it was also their invitation to be the manifestation of the love their prophet had once delivered, to be the manifestation. Again, here is my prayer. In this absence, may we turn to one another, perhaps as the starlings do, to turn to seven others and to rock each other, gently bearing collectively the weight of our loss and knowing instinctively that our connections are the source of our freedom. Salvation is never individual. It is what we do together as we rise. Amen. May it be so. Here's a reflection question for you to reflect on independently or in conversation with others. How have you been buoyed, lifted by the presence and persistence of others? How has the pain of these times been lessened by the love of others? And perhaps, who are the seven that you attend to? Now, let's turn to sing our praises, our gratitude. This is the Jazz Alleluia. Alleluia, 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 Alleluia. Hallelujah, 
In this time of challenge, we ask you to continue to support our congregation while also continuing our practice of giving to an outreach organization. 80% of your gifts will care for the Unitarian Universalist congregation at Montclair, and 20% will serve HANDS, a nonprofit neighborhood revitalization effort in Orange and East Orange. HANDS redevelops vacant homes as well as industrial and commercial buildings for affordable home ownership. HANDS provides a constructive approach to caring for urban centers, making visible improvements that lead to more awareness and social commitment. Member Georgiana Hart nominated HANDS as our Sharing Our Riches recipient, and our congregation is glad to partner with HANDS in the grateful acceptance of your offering gifts. You can text to give or go to our homepage and click on the donate button. This is a time of need. All of your gifts are worthy and they will all be received with great joy. Can you say this with us? Do, Do not, not think, think we are finished, oh, oh no. no. Do not, not think we will be silent, no. There will, will not be silence until the world has sung the names of the dead with full throats. Do not think fear is the end of us, no. Fear for our lives is not the end of this story. Until we meet again, virtually or otherwise, you are in our hearts. <laughs>